Hello and thank you for joining us. Migraine is a neurological disease that is associated with extensive disability and a poor quality of life. Successful treatment often requires a multifaceted approach. We are constantly looking for new, safe, and effective therapies. In this Neurology Live peer exchange discussion, I am joined by a panel of my colleagues, all experts in the field of headache medicine. Together, we're going to discuss the use of new and exciting therapeutic options. We'll review the latest clinical trials and provide you with a perspective on how they can best be used in your clinical practice. I'm Dr. Stephen Silberstein, Professor of Neurology at Thomas Jefferson University and Director of the Jefferson Headache Center. It is my great pleasure to announce our distinguished panel. They include Dr. David Dodick, Professor of Neurology at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine in Scottsdale, Arizona. Dr. Peter Goatsby, Director of the NIHR Welcome Trust, King's College Research Facility, King's College Hospital, and Professor of Neurology, University of California in San Francisco. And Dr. Stuart Tepper, Professor of Neurology at the Geisel School of Medicine and Director of the Dartmouth Headache Center at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. And we'll also be joined by Dr. Jessica Lane, Director of the MedStar Georgetown Headache Center and Assistant Professor of Neurology at Georgetown University. Thank you for joining us and let's begin. The first segment that we're going to be talking about today is the biology of migraine. What do we really know about it? The first topic I'd like to cover is what role do genetics play? What are the diseases that are associated with migraine? Is this something that you're stuck with because of your bad ancestors? David, tell us about this. Well, Steve, as you know, when we're in clinical practice, most of the patients that we see will report a family history of migraine. And even in those who don't report a family history, if you dig deep enough, um, you'll, 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 you'll find that there are people in the family who suffered from sick headaches or who ha complained of headaches but ne didn't necessarily receive a formal diagnosis of migraine. In fact, about 80% of the people we see have a family history of migraine. Now, migraine, like diabetes and asthma, is rather a complex polygenetic disorder in most people. And by that I mean there are multiple genes that increase the risk of one developing or expressing migraine. In fact, there are probably over 40 genes now uh, that have been demonstrated <clears throat> in large genome-wide association studies to possibly increase the risk of migraine. And recently it's been shown that the more of these variations that an individual inherits, so something called the polygenetic risk score, the more likely it is that they're going to express migraine as a disease, the more likely it is that they're going to express a severe form of the disease, and the more likely that they're going to express it at an earlier age. Um, so the more variations in those genes and the more genes that they, they've acquired or inherited, uh, the more likely they are to express severe forms of the disease. Now there are, there is a subtype of migraine called familial hemiplegic migraine. It's an autosomal dominant monogenetic disorder. About 70% of people with hemiplegic, familial hemiplegic migraine, we can do a genetic test. There are three definite genes that have been <clears throat> identified with multiple mutations in those genes uh, that are responsible for at least three quarters of the patients that we see with familial hemiplegic migraine. And when I say 70%, that means that there are more genes uh, because those other 30% have other genes that are involved. We just haven't discovered them yet. So in general, migraine is definitely a genetic disorder. It's an inherited disorder. It's polygenic in most, in most forms of migraine, but in one subtype, it is a truly a monogenetic autosomal dominant disease with single mutations that are involved in transmitting the disease. My other colleagues have any comments? I think that uh, it's, it's extraordinary how much progress we made in the narrow area of hemiplegic migraine. The, the fact that uh, the, the channel affects channel behavior, uh, the FHM1, gene is a, a channel opposite of channel opposite of the PQ voltage gated calcium channel um, and, and then we, if you contrast that with the the GWAS findings they point to such a variety of um, of, of targets uh, it's it's going to be a long time I think before genetic testing hits the prime time for um, diagnosis or for, indeed for therapeutic selection which is 
challenging and disappointing at the same time. No, I agree, Peter. And, you know, when I see patients with familial hemiplegic migraine and I say there's genetic testing available and we can do the gene testing, and they say, well, what are the implications of that? What are you going to do? And unfortunately, right now, it, as you say, it doesn't guide our therapy in one direction. Someday, undoubtedly, it will, and hopefully that will happen during our careers. Uh, but right now, that, that, that's very true. What these genes do point to is a rather some consistency in what the gene products are responsible for doing, like glutamatergic transmission. We often hear that migraine <clears throat> is a hyper-excitable disorder in the brain. And so a lot of these genetic variations encode... Uh, the, the end result is an increased uh, release of or decreased uptake of glutamate at the, at the synapse. And so that's possibly, you know, we can understand how that could be related. And then there are some genes that are responsible for vascular homeostasis. Um, and that's interesting because we know that people with migraine with aura are at an increased risk for ischemic stroke, a slightly increased absolute risk of ischemic stroke. And so perhaps there are genetic factors that influence the the, some of the complications that some of these patients experience. You know, it's very exciting. There was an article in Science a few weeks ago about this extraordinarily giant, and they were finally able to do a genetic analysis, and they showed that he had a very rare combination of multiple genes, the chance being one in a billion. But those individual gene variants added together made him extraordinarily tall which is interesting because we always thought height was related to your parents, and it just makes exactly like migraine. Multiple factors contribute to one thing. Yeah. I think the other thing, Steve, where this becomes important is in some of the comorbid diseases. There was a study published, a uh, beautiful study this year published, show, where they looked at uh, the genetic relationship between psychiatric disorders like uh, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, uh, and compared it the, the relationship, or looked at the relationship with multiple neurologic diseases from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, to Alzheimer's disease, to Parkinson's disease. The only neurological disease that had a genetic relationship with some of these psychiatric diseases was migraine. And so it's important for, you know, neurologists in general to be aware that these people are not necessarily depressed or anxious because they have migraine, but there's a shared, perhaps underlying genetic risk um, that comes, uh, that, that's responsible for the sort of comorbid uh, relationship between these diseases.